This is basically about the process that Sagi was talking about from my perspective going into working with him. Uh, so I had a problem coming into Wix uh, even before that starts with experience. And experience is something that's very valued where we, in, in our industry, it's valued to the point where uh, a lot of companies will uh, take somebody who's, who hire somebody who has more experience than somebody who has a degree. But the problem is that experience is kind of a double-edged sword. It's, it very much matters what kind of experiences you had and what, how they shaped you as a software developer. And this is what my experience taught me that, for example, version releases are this scary thing that everybody crosses their fingers and just hope to God that nothing breaks. And then, of course, it breaks. And then you get a phone call, and you start working and trying to, oh, God, let's release this thing again and just hope that it doesn't happen again. And, of course, you'd, I'd like you to believe that this is how I look when, well, I don't never look like that, but this is how I look when, when the call comes in. But usually I look like this because it's in the middle of the night. And, uh, and you lose sleep and fun. Uh, changing code means breaking code. Uh, this, this, is, this was something that, you know, I believed. I mean, if, if you change code, this happens half the time, because that's what, you know, this was my experience. Uh, so this is where my confidence level was at, uh, at, at the point where I pretty much reached Wix. Maybe a little bit before, but pretty much there. Um, and QA was usually not the answer for these things, because what happened was that not to trivialize the role, every company I've ever worked at, I'm not even sure that Wix goes into the category, but uh, everybody got it wrong. So uh, people were made into human end-to-end -end tests, and they would just sit there like drones and run the same things, like scenarios, over and over again. Frankly, it's a, a bit uh, scary to, to think about it. So, um, so that was, wasn't the answer that didn't give me any confidence. Uh, so low confidence, that's the problem. So how, how do I get more confidence? How, how do I not be afraid to release code and to change things and to touch things? So here is my coding practices at the time. When you get a new, a new task, you need to think about it. And you think about it very hard so you don't make mistakes, right? And then you think about it so hard that you start thinking about the thinking and you think some more, and then you go, I didn't think about this enough. So you think some more. And then a month passed, and I haven't done anything. And this happened to me in Wix, right at the beginning. Uh, it's the geek in the test. Uh, and, and analysis paralysis is a horrible place to be in, because it, it, it puts you in a place where there's a lot of expectation from you from yourself, other people, and you have nothing to show for, because you kept putting yourself in this loop where I don't know enough to start. And after you've muddled through that phase, then you try and understand like, the, the code of the system you're in, because rarely we write things in, a, in vacuum. We write things inside other systems. So we need to understand what those systems are like and what we need to do to make things run. Uh, of course, we don't touch anything, because then we'll break it. Uh, and lastly, we actually change the code, and then in every previous job that I've had, I'll, after changing the code, I'll you know, spin up my server locally or something on, on some staging environment, go to the UI or to whatever it is I've wrote, written, put in some, some data, push some buttons, see that it works, go, oh yeah, this is working, commit. Uh, most places I've worked at had no tests whatsoever. Uh, very few places have had uh, uh, a few tests. Usually the tests were broken, and the, the only way to get the build to pass was to just add minus D skip tests at the, at the build prompt, so you just don't run the test, so everything's green. Uh, and then if something breaks, which eventually it did, then you just start debugging. Uh, everybody <coughs> loves debugging, fantastic process, especially if you're working with like uh, dependency injection and uh, code generation, then you get all these classes where you get A, G, something, brackets, blah, fun. Um, 
And the worst part is where you make a change, it breaks something, so you go, oh, right, I just need to fix that. So you fix that thing, and it breaks two other things. Go, okay, I'll just fix this one. Now I'm going to fix this one. Five other things broke. At this point, you have no idea how to go back. And it, it looks like this. And this is something, the only way to, to clean this up is just to go, right? So, and oh, and the last thing, if, you, if I'm running code and it seems very complicated, like I wrote this really amazing algorithm, never happened, uh, but if I did something and it seems very complicated, how do I, how do I make it not complicated for, for the next person? Write a comment, of course. You, you write a comment, that's, that's what you do. There's this huge comment, right, with like all the little uh, 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 ads and little tags that makes it really nice in the ID and everything. This is one of my favorites. There's a really nice Stack Overflow um, where they ask for people to contribute their best, the best <laughs> comments they've ever seen. I really adore this one. Uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure yet that this is an actual, actual comment that somebody saw in code, but whether it is or not, great. Uh, the problem with comments is that, just like wikis, they rarely stay updated. So they, they, they go out of sync with the code. I think the next one in that thread is, uh, the comment says uh, something like, uh, this is false, and then it says variables equals true, just right underneath it. And it just shows that because comments go out of sync of the code so quickly, then they not only not help you understand what's in the code, they can actually throw you off. So those coding practices didn't help, and my confidence was rock bottom. Uh, and at that point, I, uh, I started this process where I had to expand my own toolkit, get new things, learn new ways of dealing with things, making my own code readable, making my code so it doesn't break. Uh, and it started by messing up my, uh, yeah? Okay. So here are solutions. This first solution is you have to realize that whatever you've been doing so far is probably wrong. Because, and, and this is after uh, doing this stuff for about 14 years. I wasn't a junior developer when I joined Wix. And at that point, you know, I've done a lot of stuff, and you know, you, I've, I've written servers, I've written applications, stuff worked mostly. So you go, hey, I, I know my shit, right? Well, if, you've, <laughs> if, I, if I knew my shit and everything used to break and I was afraid to change stuff, then maybe I should try to do, do things differently. So the first step is to assume that you don't know everything. And that's a very hard thing to do, especially if you have a lot of experience. Uh, and this is why. This is a research done by uh, a couple of uh, uh, psychology re uh, researchers called Dunning and Kruger. It's a very famous uh, uh, research, which is done, if I remember correctly, on the cognitive bias of uh, unskilled persons, which basically says, let's see how people per perceive themselves as skilled. Um, and as you can see, when people start out uh, they, they know that they don't know whatever it is they're trying to learn because they know nothing. But the problem is that very quickly, when you become an internet expert, uh, you gain this false notion, or is it called the quadrant of overconfidence, where you think that you know your stuff. And usually, you don't. And I have been working <laughs> With, a lot of, with all this new stuff that I've been learning and gaining confidence, and I am not there yet. So here's the first thing I did. I read this book, Object-Oriented Software Guided by Tests. It's a fantastic book on test-driven development. Uh, Nat Price, Steve Freeman, a couple of English folk that give you this book where they build an application and they show you exactly what tests are right when they write them, why they write those particular tests, how they refactor the code, how they move it around and massage it to make writing more tests possible. Uh, I recommend very much reading it if you're going into TDD and when you already know it. Reading it a second time was a 
totally different experience. Uh, but the problem is, when you start doing TDD, breaking habits is hard, and breaking bad habits is harder. So when you start doing TDD, uh, it's very hard to know what to write. Which test do I need to write, to write next? What do I need to do? You, you don't have this, this automatic notion of, yeah, sure, I'll just do this next thing. You, you're always struggling to, to, to find out what's the next step. And it's very easy to just go, you know what, I just know what software I want to write. I just know what function I want to write next. I'll just write it. Screw the test. But I've learned. Uh, and here's something that also, uh, this is a, <laughs> this is a, well, a piano. Uh, when I was about uh, five years old, I started learning the piano because my grandfather insisted that uh, the kid needs to learn his music. Uh, and very quickly it became uh, apparent that I have a, a very good penchant for learning music, but very bad, I was very bad at reading sheet music, reading music from, the reading music notes. And the reason was very obvious, I had too, too good a memory for music. The piano teacher would uh, play the piece once or twice, and I would play it once or twice, and from then on I could just play it by heart, no need for the music, I'm good, everything's fine, except for the mistakes. Because I used to make mistakes. And, you know, once you remember the mistakes, changing them, making them correct, was very, very hard. I had to practice hours and hours just to correct those few mistakes that I accidentally learned. Now imagine this is something that I accidentally learned a couple of hours ago. What do you do when you've learned the wrong things 14 years? So here's another thing. TDD feels very slow to begin with. When you write the first tests, and even now when I write bigger tests, it takes a very long time. And it feels like I used to write the software so quickly, and now everything takes hours, and I have to write all these tests. All this testing thing is stupid. Just leave me alone. Let me write some, write some code. But I learned it. Slow now is fast later, because then I don't have to debug, and I don't have to find breakages, and nobody will wake me up in the middle of the night because something was missed most of the time. So slow is fast. And the reason is feedback. TDD gives you very short iterations of feedback. I write a little bit of the test, write a little bit of the production code. Back to the test, back to production code. When something breaks, I know very quickly. And the smaller those iterations are, then the faster I know something's wrong. And basically, I can just go undo, and then I'm back to everything's green, everything's fine. And I don't have those cascading changes where I change this and that and then those and then these and then that and the, and the table with the Lego. And so that, if you do this, it doesn't happen. So small iterations, that's completely changed everything for me. Especially analysis paralysis, which was a big problem for me. This completely reduced it because I don't need to think ahead of the big product that I have to make. It's just that next little test. It's one test that I need to, 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 to write and then make it pass. Once that's done, all I need to do, run another test. So the next step becomes very obvious once you know which tests to write. Even another, if you're writing something new and big? Even if you're writing something new and big, yes. The, the, usually the something new and big starts with something completely stupid. For example, let's take that I need to write a server that does, I don't know, uh, online uh, uh, um, uh, the, the transactions for some bank or whatever. And it does it very quickly and it'll millions of transactions and all that. But the first thing that server needs to do is answer an HTTP request, right? So the first test will be, I have a server, it answers an HTTP request with 200. How do you know which technology to choose for the server? The, that's, that's a different question. How can you test for that? You don't test the, the implementation. You test the behavior. I want my uh, application to behave in a certain way. How it does it, test doesn't care. The nice thing about it is that if tomorrow I want to replace how I do it, I want to change it 
switch jetty to whatever, then the tests won't break if I change the implementation. Okay, so the question was, let me get if, if, I, if I'm getting this right. Some, sometimes if, if you're writing the test in the same environment as your code, then you might, it might be more difficult to change it. So I guess it depends on the level of tests that you write. Like tests that are a lot from the outside, uh, it's easier to change things on the inside. Like if, you, if you're sending an HTTP request to a server, the test doesn't care what server it is as long as the HTTP protocol is there and then you can write it in whatever technology you want. It's true that if you're running unit tests for a very specific thing in a very specific language, then if you're going to swap your language, then you'll have to change the test, yeah. But there's, there's this intermediate where you can choose what to do. So another thing I had to I had to learn is how to refactor things. The, the question was, how do, I, uh, how do I do this thing with legacy code? It's, uh, it's a whole different talk that I think Isla even has one. Uh, and there's a very, very good book called uh, Working Effectively with Legacy Code. Uh, but basically, it's hard. Uh, the reason that we do TDD and not just write tests afterwards is because Writing tests for existing code is hard uh, because the tests drive us to write very testable code by, by definition. And not, more, not only that, but the problem is that uh, the thing that validates that your test actually tests something is the process. It's the fact that I wrote a test, it broke when I ran it, then I wrote production code that makes the test pass, and then I know because it broke the way I expected it to, then I know it actually checks something. If I write the test afterwards, the test might be green, and then I might delete the production code and the test keeps being green. That happens, and we've seen this stuff all the time. So writing a uh, test for legacy code is very, very hard. It involves a lot of writing a lot of tests from the outside. It's a whole <laughs> different topic that I'm, I can't go into, but yeah, I, I totally relate. <laughs> um, so another thing for getting more confidence uh, is changing existing code, not the behavior, but the way the code is designed. Because code that is, I, I can write TDD till kingdom come and the code can still be crap and very hard to change. So the design of the code, whether it's object-oriented design or functional design, still has to have good design and that's the refactoring stage that often gets uh, uh, forgotten when people do TDD. TDD isn't red, green, red, green. It's red, green, refactor, red, green, refactor. And then when you go into the refactoring, you have to change the way that your code is written without changing the behavior. And that means without breaking any tests. And we're, we take this thing very, very seriously. Uh, and, and when Sagi was showing me how to change code without breaking anything for the first time, I was blown away. Because I can now change code literally without breaking compilation at any point. And it's hard work. But this book shows you how. It has, it, it's, uh, what I really like about it is that it's one of those books where they don't just give you the answer. This is how you write code. There, just do this. Uh, Martin Fowler just, takes this really badly written software and he slowly improves it, makes changes and changes and changes and improves the design. And while he makes, while he shows you the, the changes that he makes, he gives this recipes of how to make the changes <laughs> without breaking the code, without breaking the tests. And the problem when you do this thing is that you need to run the tests constantly. And when you're a guy that's, that's just starting out and you've never done TDD before, or have never refactored this way before, you keep forgetting to run the tests. And then I write for a while and change things for a while, and after a while I just go, you know what, I haven't run the tests in a while, let me just run this for a second. So here's, here's an example in Scala, for, for anyone who doesn't know Scala, it's, it's really basic, so I'll just go for the, for the basic, like think of this as pseudocode. So here's a, a really simple, simple example, like the simplest thing you can do. Uh, but it just shows 
how, how much more complicated it is than just changing stuff. Uh, I have a function, and it, ha it is accepting an integer as a parameter, and I want to change it from getting an integer to getting a, a sequence of integers, a, a list of integers. Uh, so what I would do in the olden days was just go here, change it to a list of int, everything breaks, go to the call sites where it broke, change them, now other stuff breaks, and so on and so on. Uh, so instead of doing that, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a second parameter to this function, which is a new sequence of integers. Nothing uses this thing. Not, the, not the, the code in the function, nothing from the outside. And the reason I can do this in Scala without breaking the code is that in Scala I can give uh, parameters default values, but I could just as well overload the function and just have now two functions, one that gets one and one that gets two. And now I go to the call site where this, is, where this function is called, and I add the second parameter, not removing, not changing it, not removing the old one, just adding the second one just along. Now it, it used to send an integer, and now it's sending the integer wrapped around in a sequence. I go back to the function, and I change the implementation of the function to now use the, the new parameter instead of the old one. At this point, nothing uses that old value because the implementation changed, which means I can just remove it. So I will delete it, and I'll even use my IDE to change the signature of the, uh, of the function, and it will magically remove it here and in the call site, and I'm left with my sequence of integers, and nothing broke throughout what I've done. Not compilation, nothing in the tests. This, is, this works the way I wanted to without breaking anything. And this is just a really small example. There are much more uh, complicated um, uh, refactorings, but they are all mentioned in that book, step by step, exactly how I showed it here. So refactoring is another way to get confidence, because when you change things and nothing breaks, and it's, everything keeps working, everything's green, then you know you haven't broken anything. You know that you can you can move stuff around, you can change them, you can, I want to test this thing, but I can't test it because there's some problem. I change stuff around, I move stuff around, now it's testable, I can write more tests. Uh, and refactoring becomes this thing where you have to do it because sometimes you want to test something and you can't because it's private or because it's in, uh, incorporated in something where it's harder to unit test. So I'll move it around, extract something, extract a function, extract a class, do some kind of modification without breaking things where I can, uh, I can then write new tests. And don't forget to run the tests. And the last book that I'll, I'll mention is Clean Code. This is uh, Uncle Bob or Robert Martin's uh, a, a book about uh, how to write code that is easily readable. Uh, what I really love about this book is that it starts out with him going to a lot of colleagues, people who have been in the industry for 30, 40 years, uh, and he asks them what they think clean code is. And each one of them has a different opinion. Some think that it, it's code that has no duplication in it, and some think that it has to have very concise uh, naming and that's very clear uh, and that things are... Uh, um, uh, readable just like, like a book where you, where you read stuff and they're in order. Uh, there are all kinds of different opinions. And he just goes on and, and gives these rules of thumb as to how to make code more readable. And, and for me, what, what touched uh, me uh, many times was that, that cleaning your code is, is extremely important to, to, to have people know what the intent was. And this is where comments come in. If, you're, if your code is readable, if it's understandable, nobody needs comments. And if it's not, then make it so. And cleaning your test code is even more important because the test code is the spec that tells people how your system works. Because I could theoretically go to my repo tomorrow, delete all of the production code, leave all of the tests, and then if I write new implementation, once all the tests are green, my system does exactly what it did before I deleted everything. 
but it's very hard to know what to write if I have to go to the test and start understanding what the hell's written there. If the intent is, uh, uh, is captured within the wording of the tests, then it becomes a lot clearer. So here's an example. Who can tell me in a glance what this thing does? This is a test. What is a check? Two, three, four, five. Nobody. Great. Excellent example. Uh, this, this test uh, takes a, a, an HTTP client and sends a, an HTTP request to a server and expects to get a 200 OK status. But it's very hard to read because there's a lot of implementation here that I don't really care about. And moreover, the name of the test, get a response, is, doesn't convey anything. So this is how I want it to look. And it says, my server should return an HTTP 200 OK on normal requests. And then it says, call server, and the response must be successful. Very easy to read. And it's exactly the same code you've seen before, only now the implementation, the accidental complexity, is hidden away. I don't care what it is. If I want to know how the call is made, I'll go into call server and see. And then I can even take call server and put it in several tests. And if I want to change it, then I can change it once. So it's not only call duplication, but intent is very, very important. Uh, so the question was, do I write a lot, a lot of, a lot of matchers? Because uh, when you write too many matchers, then people become, it becomes harder to read the test. So I think it's a matter it's really a matter of readability. So I'd want to create some, uh, I usually write a new matcher when combining and composing the old matchers isn't readable enough. And then I, I usually don't like to have a matcher where, that says something like, you know, that the name of the matcher is uh, a, a response with code this and that and the other and also it's great and fantastic, let's go home. Because that's unreadable. But if I can somehow find a concise way, or maybe uh, generate a few matchers that can be reused, but if I put them in an, in an and, this happens, and also this, and also this. But also, this usually um, kind of implies to me that if, if I'm having too many matchers in a test, it usually means there are several tests hiding in that test. Then I have to separate them into different tests because you're probably checking too many things. So a good name is is, is very important, uh, and not uh, and th th this is not a good name. So a good name is 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 very important, and I found that uh, sometimes, and this is with <laughs> Sagi used to berate me on this. Uh, it, it, sometimes you, you, you get to this point where you need a good name and you just can't be bothered. You go, you know what, I'll just write something doer and I'll come back to it later and I will change it. And I never do that anymore because first, I'll forget. Uh, and second, in the moment where I'm there and I'm, I need to write that name, I know exactly what this thing is. Five minutes from now, I'll lose that that space, and I might forget this little thing, and I'll, I'll have to go through the code again, just to know. Invest the time, it's important, and a good name can save a whole lot of comments, a whole lot of debugging. It, 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 it helps other people that go into your code uh, to understand what, what you're doing, and it understand people who go into legacy code to, to know how it works, and come on, let's be honest, any code you haven't touched for more than a month, it's legacy code. So, a good name. So these books I, I heartily recommend. Uh, but there's problems. There's things that I had to overcome that were very hard. For example, I had to, run to write a bunch of different types of tests. All of these things are things I write every day. How do you know which test to use when? It, it, it took me quite a long time to, to get a, a good feel of, of which tests to write when, uh, what tests to write uh, for a specific system. Um, and I found that the only thing that really helped me, uh, I'll get to that, uh, just one more thing, is another th the very difficult thing is listening to the test. This is something that people used to tell me when I just started out all the time. You have to listen to the tests. What does it mean? It's a computer. It's not speaking to me. There's a stuff on screen. Um, 
But basically what they were trying to say is that some tests are harder or easier to write. And as they used to say, you need to be as lazy as you can. Uh, because basically when something is harder to write, you're probably, your design probably suffers. So you, you need to find a way to design it better where the tests are become easier to write. It's kind of a, another feedback that's harder to listen to because how hard is hard? So this is what helped me the most, and this is where my, I think where my talk really meets uh, uh, Sagi's talk the, the most, because uh, mentoring, I, th I felt, was the most helpful thing. Somebody who can sit and pair with you for a long period of time, uh, showing you exactly what are the choices to make at a certain position. Uh, when you do the same things over and over again, suddenly they become very, very clear. It takes a long time. It's a lot, of, a lot of investment. I think it's absolutely worth it. And, and I think being a mentor, and now I'm, I'm doing it with other people, I think that it, it benefits you again. You, you learn from teaching a lot more than what you, you learn for the first time. So mentorship, I think, not only is it is a great tool for getting confidence, because when you're teaching somebody something you need to know what you're talking about. Uh, but also, I think it's, it's kind of important because we live in this world where uh, the amount of programmers grows in an insane rate, and most of the programmers don't know this stuff. And I think it's extremely important to impart this knowledge on and have people make the right decisions. And it took me many, many years to get to this point where I was even exposed to this stuff, just because you know you go to work and there's these guys. Some are better, some are worse, but nobody does this stuff. And you think, okay, so this is how we do the job. And then when you actually encounter people who do things better, then you go, wow, I can't believe I spent all these years doing things that way when I could have done it this way. And now it's very hard to think of doing them any, any, any way else. Uh, so my own confidence at the, right now is that I'm, you know, I work for Wix, and Wix pretty much says you make changes and you put them in production. And production has, you know, uh, if it's the uh, absolutely public stuff, then you, there's a quarter of a billion people watching those things. And there's 100 million sites, or I don't know. And the amount of pressure is, is very big because you, you know, <laughs> breaking Wix isn't fun. Uh, and I usually, I, I, won't see, I won't say that it's, you know, that it's confidence to the point of, like, yeah, let's just put this on and everything's fine. I'll go home. And no, it's not that. But it's, it's definitely, I'm, I'm not afraid. I, I usually have a suit of tests that I can pretty much bet my life on. Um, Although the, the, the team that I work for uh, deals a lot with infrastructure, so it's harder to test. But still, you, you, get, you, you gain so much confidence that when some things, uh, some things you know for sure th they work, and even if there are bugs and bugs happen, the same bug never returns. Because the first thing I will do is write a test that recreates the bug, fix the, the test, and at that, at that point, I know that this will never happen again, because if that happens, the test will break. So that's confidence that nothing else can give you. And repeating bugs is the most frustrating thing in the world. Questions? Uh, so basically, the question was, if I understand you correctly, basically, it's how do I know which tests to write? Do I write big tests? Do I write unit tests? Do I write from the outside in? Do I write from the inside out? Uh, it's a hard question. Uh, I think there are, there are no definite answers. Uh, uh, it depends on the amount of experience you have. I think uh, if, you, if you're just starting out with TDD, uh, if, and if you go the goose, the growing and object oriented stuff guided by test style, you'll start from the outside in because it just makes the whole process easier. So first, what I'll usually do is write a big test that test this happy scenario of everything's working just to make sure that all of my uh, uh, infrastructure, all of, my, all of my, my technology stack works. So I'll 
spin up my server and my database and my MQ or whatever it is, uh, and I'll see, I'll, I'll, I'll go through this really thin, thin path, even with a lot of hard-coded stuff in it, just to make sure that that works. And from that point on, I'll try to write as many unit tests as I can to, to expand the, the functionality. Uh, and, and again, the, it was one of the slides where uh, it, a lot of, the, a lot of, the, of it depends on your, on your design. So we try, for example, to work in a ports and adapters uh, uh, architecture where ev everything in the world that isn't your code is on the outside, and then you have to write integration tests to see that you can talk correctly to it, and your own stuff is written in unit tests, and we have contract tests for the outside, and we have learning tests for the outside. The, knowing which tests to write is definitely a, it's a learning curve. Anyone else? Thank you very much.